the ruler's creed, an ultimate guide for kings and persons in position of high responsibility. Written by King Adegoke, read by the author. In a very real sense, this is my life's work. My generation accepts the concept of royalty as that of ruling one's own nature. In essence, he that is king over himself is the true king. This presentation suggests that being king is to have sovereignty over the world and over all material things. The listener is made to feel independent of men by neither taking orders from them nor hung upon their approbation or disapprobation and to never depend upon their love for joy or frightened by their hate. My focus is solely on kings, the ministers and counsellors of kings and for the inferior magistrates by whatever name they called, that their lives may be prolonged, governments be secured to them, their families preserved in safety, their senates faithful to them, their armies brave, their people honest, and that the whole realm may be at peace. So much depends on their character and plans that the security of life, liberty and property depends so much on them. Security, then, is one great object of kings and governments. It is the glory of government to all the shield of all, to defend the poor, the fatherless and the widow, as well as the men of might, and the great and the noble. Throughout the content of this presentation, the listener may find some antiquated quotes and must not be thought of as subjective, but rather to guide listeners in the path towards enlightenment. The term king, monarch, ruler, ascribes to the male gender but it is to be appreciated as not distinctive to a particular class and gender in society, but employed as a form of generic phrase to ensure consistency and therefore applicable both to male and female alike. In this presentation, I described God as the universal life force by which a king is ultimately accountable. I regard this presentation as phenomenal and the listener is encouraged to contemplate on this literature as it is designed to inspire the mind and to provoke the senses. To acquire knowledge, one must study, but to acquire wisdom, one must observe. Several quotations have come into play in this research, most of which are from theological and political authors. I have ensured consistent referencing techniques of the excerpts mostly originated from ecclesiastical hearts. The relevance of the extracts intrinsically published by century-old authors are viewed as significant to the demands of the present times. However, they must not be thought of as radical or extremists in nature or in motives. Some fragments of the quotes have been presented as a form of continuous prose and therefore assert that by no means does this document seek to infringe on the right of the original authors and their publishers. Monarchy, the establishment, 
This is a form of government in which sovereignty is actually or nominally embodied in one or several individuals. Monarchy is political or sociocultural in nature and is generally but not always associated with hereditary rule. Thus, a monarch may exercise the most and highest authority in the state or others may wield that power on behalf of the monarch. The establishment is instinctive with a pledge to society for tenure and achievements. Ruler A ruler is learned and merciful, a person of gracious and level-headed nature that encourages education and improves the structure of his legal and military system and his people's quality of life. One whose presence puts life and courage and joy into the whole army. An ideal ruler is typically one who has the highest qualities of leadership, intellect, energy and personal attributes. The resilience of being sure than neighboring governments and having ministers of high quality constitutes one of the many fundamental qualities of a ruler. Thus, an energetic ruler is one who is vast, determined, quick, and dexterous. As regards personal attributes, an ideal ruler is required to be eloquent, bold, and endowed with a sharp intellect, a strong memory, and a keen mind. He should be amenable to guidance. A ruler's intellectual life is traditionally known to be accountable to God. In essence, by aiding influences and providential arrangements, God disposes the monarch to order his government so as to carry out his designs and to spread around joy and plenty. Role of a king in society. King. A king is one who has the highest qualities of leadership, intellect, energy, and personal attributes. Such person must have been sufficiently trained to know how to govern in normal times and in times of crisis, and when to fight and when to make peace when to lie in wait and when to observe treaties and when to strike at an enemy's weakness. Such person preserves his dignity at all times, sweet in speech, looks straight at people and avoids frowning. He eschews passion, anger, greed, abstinency, fickleness and backbiting. As part of ensuring an organized society, a king is to be accorded with the same reverence and respect paid of kings. A king, being a leader by example, must show a sheer determination to succeed with full confidence in himself and to have an industrious prosecution of the business of his vocations and by preventing idleness. A king honors himself when he makes diligent inquiry of the human nature and learns all that he can about mankind. The tenure of kings are harmonious when surrounded with good counselors and advisors, the outcome of which fosters stability, optimism and the aspiration to promote his ministers. A prudent king acknowledges and continues in the legacy of his predecessors and the luminaries before him and seeks to protect the established landmarks. The reign of kings require that they are in active service to the very moment of their passage from the world and must seek to ensure that history remembers them for exceptional achievements.
the wisdom of a king together with his appearance are of charismatic impulse in the minds of his people. A king is required to be disciplined as an early riser and a time man to avoid coming to poverty. A king is limited to lawful delights, an attitude towards promiscuity and intoxicants will determine his of tenure and the prosperity of the realm. Craftsmanship and natural talents are exceptional skills associated with a king. The power to invent and originate as to be a first-class artisan is useful to a king when giving good counsel, delivering important maxims and even making a war. A king's soul. It is a known explanation that a king's soul possesses leadership, qualities by nature, with an innate sense of power and personal authority. Like warriors, kings are action-oriented souls. But whereas warriors are attracted to action on the front line, as it were, King souls prefer to be in a commanding position from which they can oversee and run the entire operation. The very name King suggests that such souls have a commanding presence, an innate power, and even a regal here about them. King souls are born leaders, and others will tend to automatically look to them for leadership and direction. A king's reason for being is to assume command and to take charge, not just as the ultimate decision maker, but also the one who takes ultimate responsibility. King souls tend to see the world around them as their personal chessboard and others are pieces to be moved about. They have a knack for orchestration and tactical maneuvering and are happy making far-reaching decisions that affect many people. King souls are completely autonomous, powerful and responsible in charge of both themselves and their surroundings to good effect. They can achieve unity of effort and synergy of action, empowering others to achieve great things. Give power to others rather than take it from them. A great leader, it is said, is one who creates more leaders, not first. Unlike any other role, king souls appear to be in full possession of themselves. Internal conflict is not something they struggle with very often. Self-assuredness is part of their very nature. Doubt is almost unknown. King souls are naturally dominant in life and therefore not happy in submissive roles. Even as the youngest member of the family, a child king will want to rule the roost. Through life, King souls will tend to assume leadership and responsibility with little effort on their part. Nevertheless, they are not always in actual positions of power. Like all other souls, kings will experience life from every possible angle. This is important for the sake of balance. They can be beggars as well as presidents. Wherever they are, however, they will still emanate kingly qualities, assertiveness, directness, self-assuredness, and an aura of certainty, power, and authority. Baby kings tend to be ultra-conservative leaders in small communities, the town mayor, the chief of police, the mafia boss. There are exceptions, of course. Young kings, on the other hand, are natural empire builders,
capable of grand achievements whilst mature king seeks to use their leadership and commanding presence more thoughtfully and creatively such as in the hearts old king seeks to become masters of their own power for the good of society or the world at large king a royal servant a king is anyone in a position of high responsibility the throne here is referred to as his office a king do not exist for himself the reason why he was crowned is to be of service to his people it is a huge responsibility it is tempting however for a king to shut the world out and have no regard whatsoever for the welfare and concerns of his people the strength of a monarch's throne is service for and sympathy with these people a throne built on such a foundation will last unshaken forever the people do not exist for the king they may be governed as a republic without a king but a king exists for the people where no people are therefore there can be no king for a king to use the people simply for his own aggrandizement and ignore their rights is preposterous the interest of a good king will be bound up with the happiness of his leaders and he cannot reasonably object to a constitution that will recognize this community of interests the loyalty of love is stronger and more enduring than that of fear who rule over a loving people may be tranquil he need not fear the point out of the assassin he will have the joy of ruling over a happy nation the typical constitutional monarch is the father of his people A king must condescend to his people and behave in an humble manner towards them and gratify and oblige them. Though indeed a king is but a servant to his people and his administration of government a doing service to them. A king mild, humble and gentle perceiving his son to have behaved in a fierce and violent manner towards his leaders said to him my son dost thou not know that our glorious kingdom is a servitude and answer them and speak good words unto them give them a soft answer and speak kindly and gently to them and make them fair promises and give them reasons to expect that their request will be granted such conduct would so win upon them and make such an impression upon them that they would forever after entertain high opinions of you and be strongly affected and attached to you and readily serve you this is a constitutional idea of a king he is the servant but not the slave of his people every regal act of a just king is an act of service to the state a king is not only the fountain of law and justice but as he has the appointment of all officers and judges consequently he is the executor of the laws and all justice is administered in his name but simply, a good and constitutional king is the servant of his people, and in being such, he is their father and their king. The way to ensure the obedience of the people is to hold them in the reins of empire with a steady and impartial hand. Let the people see that the king lives for them, and not for himself and they will obey, love and defend him. 
the state is maintained on the part of the ruler and the ruled by mutual acts of service and benevolence. A good king has no self-interest, and such a king will ever have obedient and loving leaders. The haughty, proud tyrant will have a suspicious and jealous people hourly ripening for revolt. A king is made for the people, not the people for a king. And let every potent wisely consider this, and let every subject know that the heaviest cares rest on the heart, and the heaviest responsibility rests on the head of a king. And let them therefore, under his government, fashion themselves as obedient children, acknowledge him their head, and duly consider whose authority he has, that they may love, honor, and obey him. Happy are the people who have such a king. Safe is a king who has such a people. The Head As the head, a king is chief of all people in power, or at least in dignity and privileges, so that even they that are not under his authority shall reverence his greatness and excellence. Thus possessing independent power and great dignity and acknowledged excellence, being therefore superior to other people in honor and dignity, and not below them or vassals to them. Determination to succeed. Englishmen, for instance, are renowned for success. According to the nature and quality of their brain power. Lord Wolseley suggests that first step on the ladder that leads to success is firm determination to succeed. And the next is the position of that moral and physical courage which will enable one to mount up wrong after wrong until the top is reached. The best men make false steps now and then and even have very bad falls. The weak and pulling cry of their misfortunes and seek for the sympathy of others and do nothing further after their first or second failure. But the plucky and the courageous pick themselves up without a groan over their broken bones or their first failures and set to work to mount the ladder again, full of confidence in themselves and with faith in the results that always attend upon cheerful perseverance. Lord Bacon says, of all the qualities which kings especially look to and require in the choice of their servants, that of dispatch and energy in the transaction of business is the most acceptable. There is no other virtue which does not present somehow shadow of offence to the minds of kings. Expedition in the execution of their commands is the only one which contains nothing that is not acceptable. There must be the diligent use of these natural powers. Simply for a man to possess certain capacities and faculties, physical or mental, is not sufficient. He has to discipline and practice, develop and perfect them. The stigma of folly and the terror of ruin alike are declared against that man who is careless and uncertain, who heeds not the opportunities which are presented to him and lets the precious moments of life fly by while his powers are undisciplined and his God is unserved. Industry A king is encouraged to have an industrious prosecution of the business of his vocations with unwary diligence and vigour and expedition. Our mind being a restless thing, never abiding in a total cessation from thought or from design. If metals be employed, they abide smooth and splendid, 
but lay them up and they will soon contract rusts. If the earth be laboured with culture, it yielded corn, but neglected, it will be overgrown with bricks and thistles. And the better its soil is, the ranker weeds will it produce. Accordingly, our condition and circumstances in the world are so ordered as to require industry, so that without it we cannot support our life in any convenience. For he that aspires to worthy things and assays laudable designs, pursuing them steadily with serious application of art and resolute activity, will rarely fail of good success and consequently will not miss honour, which ever does crown victory. Industry begets ease by procuring good habits, a facility of transacting things expedient to be done. It breeds assurance and courage needful for the prosecution of business and the performance of duties. The very exercise of industry immediately in itself is delightful. The very settlement of our mind on fit objects whereby we are freed from doubt and distraction ministers content. The consideration that we are spending our time and talents to good advantage in service to God, benefiting our neighbour and bettering our own states is very cheering and comfortable. Industry aspires to things of high worth and pursuing them with courage. It signifies the earth not enduring to all the sustenance and convenient life to the liberality of others. Industry prevents the sins of vain curiosity, pragmatical troublesome impertinence and the like pests of common life into which persons not diligently following their own business will assuredly fail. Industry is needful in every condition and calling of life in all relations for our good behaviour and right discharge of our duty in them. Are we rich? Then industry is requisite for keeping and securing our wealth or managing it wisely. Are we conspicuous in dignity, honour and good repute amongst men? Then industry is requisite to keep us fast in that state since nothing is more frail than honour which must be nourished by worthy actions otherwise it will shall decay. On the other hand are we poor and low in this world then do we much need industry to shun the extremes of want and ignominy and to improve our condition. However his enthusiastic admirers may dispute this Certain it is that Charles Dickens trusted to no such uncertain lights as the fire of genius. Day in, day out, by hard work, he elaborated the plot, characters and dialogue of his imperishable stories. All days he would spend to discover suitable localities and then be able to give vividness to his description to them, while sentenced by sentence, his work after apparent completion was retouched and revised. The great law of labour makes no exception of the gifted or ignorant. Whatever the work may be, there can be no success in it without diligent, unceasing, persevering labour. Men that take pains in an honest employment, and especially those that labour to be useful to others, will thereby gain such an interest and reputation as will give them a superiority over all about them. Through diligence men get riches, and through riches they arrive to power and authority over others. From apprentices to Johnny men, workmen, 
they become masters of their business. Diligent men become masters of families and have servants and workmen under them. Some become magistrates in cities and bear rule over their fellow citizens and are advanced to places of power and authority in the commonwealth. The strong and active men are sure to rise to the surface and get the upper run in a community. Diligent hands are speedily rendered experts. Daniel Webster once replied to a young man who asked him if there was any room in the legal profession. There is always room at the top, he said. The better you know your business, the more you are likely to rise. You can gather much information by making a wise use of your eyes and ears and perhaps be able to surprise your employer in an emergency by stepping into the next man's. So learn your business, he said, and you will find that there is room at the top. Slothfulness. A king must eschew acts of deceitfulness. And from those who uses many trickling and fraudulent ways and methods to live. As usually slothful people do. It doth long prosper with them who use such unlawful methods. Without diligence, honesty can scarcely be expected. An unoccupied and idle man countervails all the laws both of his animal and intellectual frame and wages wars upon every organ of his material structure. If you would make a man miserable, let him have nothing to do. Idleness is the nursery of crime. The inattentive and sluggish worker is constantly descending. He is on an incline and is going downwards. All things connected with his vocation or with his own mind or with his moral and spiritual condition are gradually but seriously suffering decline, decay, disease have set in and will spread from day to day, from year to year. He that manages his affairs rashly without due consideration is likely to bring himself to poverty. By bearing false witness or by any deceitful words or acts such as those by which many men get riches, like the chaff of smoke driven away by the wind, it is neither satisfactory nor durable but quickly vanishes away. As has been frequently observed of estates ill-gotten, the man who labours in substantial and continuous methods must be he who in pursuit of gain is an excessive haste, otherwise called the impatient, restless fortune hunter, using deceitful modes of acquiring and for that very reason for a punishment is plunged into destitution and penury. Such who are sharp and acute, however, are careful and industrious. They mind their own business and do the honest parts. These with a divine blessing frequently grow rich. Our life is dependent on our industry. It is good for a man that he should have to labor. By the diligent we are to understand the nimble-handed, those who are acting agile, who will lose nothing for want of rising early and peering about in the darkness if they may but catch a glimpse even of an outline of things. The persons referred to in the text are those who take accounts of microscopic matters. They are particular about the smallest coins 
about moments and minutes, about so-called secondary engagements and plans. The true businessman lives in the midst of his business. The earth brings forth thorns instead of grapes, unless it be cultivated. A world bringing forth food spontaneously may have suited a sinless race, but it would be unsuitable for mankind as they are now. The work is difficult, the times are bad, and when all accounts are closed, he who is rich in faith is the richest man. The industrious man accomplishes very many things which are profitable to himself and others in numberless respects. He executes many useful matters with far more ease and dexterity than if he were not industrious. He has no need of any long previous contests with himself. He understands, he loves the work has a certain confidence in himself and is more or less sure of success. He unfolds, exercises, perfects his powers, not only his mechanical, but also his nobler, his mental powers. He lives in the true, intimate, entire consciousness of himself and of that which he and he does. He actually rejoices in his lives, his faculties, his endowments, his time. He experiences neither languor nor irksomeness. Never are his faculties, never is his time a burden to him. He has a far greater relish for every innocent pleasure, for every relaxation that he enjoys. He alone properly knows the pleasure of rest. He fulfills the designs for which he is placed on earth and may say so to himself and many in the consciousness of it being contented and cheerful. A king must be ready to avail himself of the hour of opportunity to gather when the coin is ripe is necessary if the toil of the husbandman is to bear its fruits. To let the crop alone when it is ready for the sickle is to waste the labor of many weeks. Readiness to reap is of as much consequence as willingness to work. The wakeful high must be on every field of human activity or energy and patience will be thrown away. We must covet and cultivate mental alertness, spiritual attitude, readiness to strike when the hour has come, or we shall miss much of the fruit of our labor. It is the general who knows when to give the word charge that wins the battle. When a king carefully and industriously prosecutes what he has wisely contrived and resolved, it leads to affluence and wealth. The diligent employ foresight as well as labor. Undue hurry is as fatal to success as undue procrastination. A man that is thoughtful and studious and wisely forms schemes in his mind and diligently pursues them, the issue of it is, generally speaking, prosperity and plenty. Such a man is usually thriving and flourishing, and this holds good in things spiritual as well as things plural. Patient industry is rewarded by a certain increase Diligence is a fair fortune, and industry a good estate. 
The diligent man plans first and then acts. He proceeds thoughtfully and systematically. Diligence means steady perseverance in execution. The projects of the attentive, plodding, persevering man who begins in earnest and goes on to the end in earnest, prepared for difficulties, are those that promise to produce and generally do produce a favorable result. Diligent labor is the ready way to riches, but idle talking, wherein too many spend most of their precious time, will bring a man to poverty. For it commonly comes to pass that they who talk liberally boast much and promise mighty matters are beggars and receive no benefit by their brags or by anything they discourse of. For the most part, such men are not industrious and diligent in their employment, but only feed and fill themselves with words as with wind. In all labor there is profit, much is gotten by it, food, raiment, riches, wealth, wisdom, honor, either with the labor of the hands or the labor head. And nothing is to be had without labor. And he that is laborious in this calling, whether it be by manual operation, working with his hands, that which is good, or by hard study, much reading, and constant meditation, is likely to gain much for his own use and the good of others. But the talk of the lips tends only to penury or want of food and raiment, the common necessaries of life. A man that spends his time in idle talk, boasting of what he can do and does, and yet does nothing, isn't a fair way to come to beggary. So all talk about wisdom and knowledge and religion, without making use of the proper means of improvement, tends to poverty of the mind, and generally they are most empty of knowledge, natural or spiritual, that talk and brag most of it. Empty casts make the greatest sound. Good discourse, wholesome words, sound doctrine, thoroughly digested, tend indeed to edification, to the enriching of the mind. All honest industry has a reward and all care and pain born for a good object bring comfort and content. The language of actions is more eloquent than the language of words. Whatsoever is what doing is what doing well. It is always worthwhile to take pains. It is a short-sighted mistake to avoid taking trouble as industry always repays itself. We ought to be made wiser and better men and women by our work. And whatever you begin, finish. Look upon your work as an honorable calling and as a blessing to yourselves, not merely as a hard necessity, a burden which must be done. Idleness makes a man restless, discontented, greedy, the slave of his own lusts and passions. Being forced to work and forced to do your best will breed in you temperance and self-control, diligence and strength of will, cheerfulness and content, and a hundred virtues which the harder man will never know. There is a sense in which all your hands in advantage. It is so in learning, in study, in the prosecution of hearts, in devotion to business, in the study of character. Indeed, 
throughout the whole circle of human thought and occupation. Labor means industry, devotion, consciousness, attention to affairs that demand our interests. It is set in opposition to the talk of the lips, mere breathing, mere foaming, mere boasting, worthy declarations of great programs which are never brought to realization. Society would no longer be consolidated and secure if mere talk brought men to honor and wealth and solidity of position. In all society, the laborers must be more in number than the talkers. Understand that nothing is here said against talk. Society cannot do without speech. Eloquence has a great part to play in the education of the world. What is spoken against is the talk of the lips, that is, mere talk, talking for talking's sake. Love of hearing oneself speak, talking with the lips where the heart is taking no part in the communication. When a man truly talks his intellect, his heart, his conscience, his judgment, his whole being speaks. Every word is marked by sacredness of purpose. Every promise is a vow. Every declaration binds the soul. It must not be understood that anything whatever it said in disparagement of talk, speech and eloquence, we must again and again remind ourselves that the talk that is condemned is formal, mechanical, Labial, taking nothing of virtue out of the speaker and communicating nothing of strength to the hearer. There is a talk that is profitable. The talk of the preacher, the lecturer, the statesman, the barrister more often tend to affluence than to, than to penury. By labor, honest well-directed labor, man gets not only the necessities, but comforts, luxuries, the elegance and the elevated positions of life. There is no true labor that is vain. If you wish to lead a happy life, you will never find it in what you are to get, but you will find it in what you are to give. Get out of this pointless, easygoing, unsatisfying, useless life. In the morning, do not waste your time in bed, but wake early to the realities of life. Discipline yourself, even in dressing. Have some arrangements. Try to raise your own and others' conversation to a higher level. Life is full of trouble, and we must shoulder our share with the best grace we can. Any hard work gives the mind other matters of concern, and also tires the body so as to ensure sleep. A king knows that power is inborn, that people are weak because they look for good out of circumstances instead of themselves. He throws himself upon his own personality and stands in an erect position, commands his limbs and succeeds in achievements because he perceives it lies with himself to strengthen and develop his faculties. An age like this, when every hour must sweat at 60 minutes to the death, Physical labor not only cultivates the fields and builds the house and clothes the naked, but it gives strength to the muscles and health to the whole body. Likewise, mental labor not only designs the paintings or the sculpture or the oratory and writes the poem or the history, but it invigorates the mind and braces all the mental faculties. 
in an uncle on the lady who does her own work. Mrs. Harriet Baker Stowe dwells on the value of housework in giving the very healthiest form of exercise and for the average woman shows it to be far preferable to the work of the masseurs who even in those days more than 200 years ago seem to have found plenty of patience would it not be quite as cheerful and less expensive a process she asks if young girls from early life developed the muscles in sweeping dusting ironing, rubbing furnitures, and all the multiplied domestic processes which our grandmothers knew of, and then hats. I will venture to say that our grandmothers in a week went over every movement any gymnast has invented, and went over them to some productive purposes too. Here is a hint that women with thin arms would do well to take. It is said to be really a fact that Clara Lewis Kellogg, the singer, when a young girl, was much annoyed by the flaccid appearance of her arms when she began to wear evening dress at a crowded concerts. Someone recommended a brisk use of the broom which advice she followed and soon had a round plump member as the reward of her labor. If a thin listless girl with a door high and a stir can by any means be persuaded to try the broom cure, she will be astonished to find what a beautifier it really is. Men that take pains in an honest employment and especially those that labor to be useful to others will thereby gain such an interest and reputation as will give them a superiority over all about them and those who are diligent while they are young frequently procure that wealth and power which enable them to rule and so to rest when they are old. Mr. Chauncey M. Dippew tells the story of his visits to the mechanical department of Cornell University. He found at the head of it Professor Morris, who claimed him as a superior officer, given as a reason that he was an old-time worker on the New York Central Railway. How did you get here? asked Dippew. I was a stoker on the New York Central, he said. I stood on the footboard as an engineer on the Central. While a locomotive engineer, I made up my mind to get an education. I studied at night and fitted myself for Union College, running all the time with my locomotive. I procured presentations and attended as far as possible all lectures and recitations. I kept up with my class and on the day of graduation I left my locomotive, washed up, put on a gown and cap, delivered my thesis and received my diplomas, put the gown down and the cap in the closet, put on my walking shirt, got on my engine and made my usual run that day. Then, says Dippy, I knew how he became Professor Morris. That spirit will cause a man to rise anywhere and in any calling. When wonder is expressed at the rise of ordinary men, as a rule, it is not the greatest wits who fill the high places of the realm, but the greatest workers. Many busy, energetic, energetic fussy people miscarry because their activity is ill-placed. To neglect one's proper vocation is idleness, no matter what may be the uncalled for activity in other directions. A man of strength and activity and of talent 
doing thoroughly and well what came to hand. This is the secret of success, both in student and business life. Diligence and fidelity should be ours, whether or not we have the notice of the earthly master. When successful, it is possible to defend others, to lighten the burdens of others, and to become ready for lofty rule. Problem solving. It is the glory of all governments to frame wise and salutary laws for the well-being and true happiness of society. To guard these sanctions and by all the majesty of power, governments do not originate that which is moral in law. They do not create the distinctions between right and wrong, good and evil. Magistrates are the representatives of the law. They are to see that it is respected and maintained and they are to punish lawbreakers. If not, it is because offenders baffle pursuits and hide themselves. If kings do not search out a matter, it is because they are indifferent to the conduct of their leaders and care not whether they are virtuous or vicious and then the hour of rev revolution is at hand. A kingdom will fall. The true foundation of authority is not force, but moral power, not might, but right. How often in our time have thrones tottered or the occupants fallen when physical force alone was recognized as a basis of security? Justice is printed upon the nature of man. And let rulers who would maintain their power ever appeal to reasons and to right. And he who takes the motto, Be just and fear not, for the maxim of his policy lays the holy stable foundation of law and government. A king is acting in a way that honors him when he searches human nature and knows all that he can learn about mankind, all, therefore, that he can know about his leaders. He acquaints himself with the character, the disposition, the career of those immediately about him, in whom he trusts, on whom he leans. He investigates different affairs as they arise, probing and sifting most carefully not satisfied until he has searched the whole thing through. It becomes a king to make the most complete and patient investigation into all national affairs. It is the honor of kings with a close application of mind and by all the methods of inquiry to such are the matters that are brought before them to take the pains in examining offenders that they may discover their designs and bring to light the hidden works of darkness. Not to give judgment hastily or till they have weighed things, not to leave it wholly to others to examine things, but to see with their own eyes. Princes have their state secrets designs which are kept private and reasons of state which private persons are not competent judges of and therefore ought not to pray into. Wise princes, when they search into a matter, have riches which one would not think of. As King Solomon, when he called for a sword to divide the child with, designing thereby to discover the true mother, Kings concern their minds with matters purely political, which can be thoroughly searched out and understood in all their practical relations and bearings. Kings are not to live a haphazard life, taking things for granted and giving rough solutions of subtle and vital problems. They have to diligently consider the philosophy of statesmanship and sovereignty 
and to rest their throne up on the basis of reason. So also, when it comes to matters of practical justice, they are not to take superficial views of cases brought under judgment. They are to search into them, to compare statements, to trace out the operations of motives, and thus are to reach conclusions which should be marked by reasonableness and equity. Nothing frivolous is becoming in rulers, even justice itself, how practical soever it may appear, is founded upon the deepest philosophy. A man should not extemporize law, even for social purposes, because law that is extemporized is likely to be inspired by passion and to be marred by partiality or prejudice. It is the beauty of the deepest and grandest social law that it was formed in anticipation rather than in retrospect of social order or disorder. Magistrates do not sit on the bench to make law and to formulate punishments when they are under the excitement of an individual case. The law was made in secret, in solemn quietude, under a deep sense of responsibility, and is therefore supposed to be untainted by prejudice or passion. The magistrate has simply to acquaint himself with the law and to administer it in its purity. Advisors Kings and rulers stand in special need of counsel, and when a ruler is sur surrounded by good counsellors, he and his people are safe. We can trace this truth in the rise and fall of nations. Man is apt to go astray. His judgment is sometimes misled, while his affections are corrupted and his will is ungoverned. It is not safe to go indiscriminately to all sorts of people with a statement of our difficulties the, and entreaties for advice in dealing with them. Supreme wisdom comes to us with greatest force when it flows through the channel of hearts bound closely to our own. The danger of resenting counsel when it is pleasant is one with which we are all aware of. There is a spirit and a manner in some cows which is not in human nature to bear, but we must take care lest we be displeased with others whose advice we get, simply because we dislike it. All kings should light in employing such counsellors, judges and officers under them, are just and faithful in their counsels, sentences and actions because such bring great honour and advantage to them. Such that speaks truth and righteousness and advice to the administration of justice and judgment and to do that which is most for their own true honour and people's good are all to be highly valued and esteemed by kings. But the contrary is too often the case. Kings echoing to those that speak lies, that flatter them and gratify their pride, ambition and love of power to the hurt of their leaders. The ideal king pleasures in the truth and justice which his leaders display in their conversation. Such a one aids flattery and dissimulation and encourages honest speaking. Here is a further character of good kings, that they love and delight in those that speak right. They hate parasites and those that flatter them, and are very willing that all about them should deal faithfully with them, and tell them that which is true, whether it be pleasing or displeasing. Both concerning persons and things, that everything should be set in a true light and nothing disguised. They not only do righteousness themselves, but take care to employ those under them that do righteousness, which is of great consequence to the people, who must be subject not only to a king as supreme, but to the governors by him. 
a good king will therefore put those in power who are conscientious and will say that which is righteous and discreet and know how to speak aright and to the purpose. There is no class of men that value uprightness more than kings, as none stand in so much need of it in their servants. Who is plain hearted or sincere and abhors dissimulation? Whose heart is so free from guile and places his pleasure in the integrity of his mind and the purity of his conscience? For those gracious speeches which naturally and commonly flow from a pure heart, or whose discourse is gracious and sincere, the greatest in will or should desire and highly prize the acquaintance and advice of such persons, rather than of dissemblers and flatterers, with whom they are too generally surrounded. A king shall be his friend and carry himself friendly to him, Admit him to familiarity with him, and take him to his court, and make him of his privy counsel. This is what a king should do, and what a wise and good king will do, and it is his interest to do so. And he who is not only been upright, but has the gift of graciousness of speech, winning manner in conversation, such a man will attach a king to him. By the closest bond of friendship. A country is safe when there are many wise men to govern affairs, that if one fail, there may enough still remain. Or what one or two see not, others may be able to discern. A man who tells his own story and is the first to open his case before a king seems for the moment to have justice on his side. He can make a good case for himself it, and persuade himself that what is against his own wish is also against righteousness and argues accordingly. But the opposition examines the truth and weight of these allegations and disproves them and detects the weakness of his cause. Put simply, he sits and scrutinizes the statements already given, shows them to be erroneous, or weakens the evidence which appear to support them. <laughs> Thus the maxim, one story is good till the other is told. Stability. A king, when his look is cheerful and bright, he sheds in life around, as the rain refreshes the parched ground. His favour and smiling countenance is most sweet and refreshing. Ever while human nature continues what it is, the smile of the sovereign, the tokens of his favour, the star, the medal, the garter, the uniform, will be sought after with eagerness and worn with pride. There may be a side of idle vanity in this, yet equally a side of good. It is good to seek association with greatness. The love and faithfulness he shows to his leaders draw out the same qualities in and these are the safeguard of his throne. A king is obliged to show mercy by an act of grace, both by his duty and interest because it is a singular means of his preservation. A king is not to rule his people with rigor and cruelty, but with tenderness and clemency, easing them as much as he can of burdens and pressures, showing compassion to the distressed and pardoning delinquents when the case will admit of it, as also being faithful to his word, promises and engagements Invaluably adhering to the laws and constitution of the nation and steady in his administration of justice, these preserve him in the affections of his people and make him safe and secure on his throne. A king is well called the father of his people, and in modern time, epithet gracious is applied to the sovereign as fountain of mercy 
and condescension. The text love, says our English maxim, is a king's lifeguard. And when wicked men are removed from the court and cabinet council, a king is the happier and is thrown more firm as the ill. It is not enough that he is pure himself, but that he put away others who are corrupted. A king must detect the evil and punish them. And this confirms his rules and secures the continuance of his dynasty. Kings, through their magistrates, are to banish those from the courts who are vicious and profane and to frighten them and restrain them from spreading the infection of their wickedness among the people. A pure or vicious court has immense influence on the manners and morals of the community. Favors The king will respect and prefer those who behave themselves wisely and virtuously, whatever enemies they may have that seek to undermine them. Do you see a man who does his precious business well, committed to him, manages all his affairs wisely and prudently, and is diligent and careful to do everything for a king's honour and the good of his leaders, such a one has a share in royal favour and place in the affections of the master and is sure to be promoted to honour by him and exalted to higher places of trusts and profits as well as to be protected and defended by him. A king should have an intelligent man for his minister, a man of deep sense, sound judgment and of a feeling merciful disposition. He who has not the former will plunge the nation into difficulties and he who has not the latter will embark in dis disastrous wars. Most wars are occasioned by bad ministers, men of blood who cannot be happy but in enduring and endeavouring to unchain the spirit of discord. Almost every discovery in science has been led up to by forgotten workers, the discoverer who after all has only taken the last step in a long process, lives in history. For instance, a minister rises in his place in parliament to make a statement which astonishes us by its familiarity with the details of a vast and intricate subject. But while the country is ringing with his praises, the fact is that the knowledge which so astonishes England has been brought together by the patient oil of the permanent staff of the department, the toil of clerks, whose names are perhaps unknown beyond their own families. A king should walk up to the moment of his passage out of the world, his last breath should, if possible, help someone to pray better, to work more, or to suffer with a firmer constancy. Let no man suppose that the world stands still because it dies. God has always a temple to build, and he will always raise up the build of it. And yet it pleases him in his condescension to receive assistance in preparation. The militant. A king is warlike in character, strong and daring, and that he should enrich himself with the spoil of his enemies, that he should be active in the world, and a family as much feared by their neighbours as any other. The ruler is adorned with an honourable encomium to show fortitude, courage and valour, as well as rapaciousness and diligent in plundering. From morning unto evening, a king is quick and powerful. The Appearance A king must have a fine appearance. A tall stature was much valued in a king in ancient times. 
and in the eastern countries. A king must be well shaped in the prime of his age, a very agreeable person, one among a thousand. A king is encouraged to have a personable appearance superior to others, walking statelier than the rest. Alexander's captains, it is said, might be thought to be kings for their beautiful form, height of body, and greatness of strength and wisdom. Physical qualifications of stature, strength, and beauty are a natural commendation for the dignity of a king. Do not despise a fine physique. Plato calls it a privilege of nature. Homer calls it a glorious gift of the God. An intelligent mind and a kindly heart as necessary almost to make a face truly beautiful as form and complexion. It is natural enough that the people should take pride in the charismatic proportions of their leader as calculated to strike terror in the enemy and to inspire confidence in its followers. Besides that, it was no mean advantage that the crest of the leader should from his appearance be seen afar by the people. A king must be of high spirit and courtly manners, with nothing deficient or superfluous in him, no disproportion of parts, nor any disagreeable feature, but an entire symmetry and perfect comeliness. Such one is of fine appearance and fascinating manners, admired by others. For the great mass of the public is ever caught and led by outward appearances. Beauty is a thing of great recommendation in the correspondence amongst men. It is the principal means of acquiring the favor and good liking of one another. And no man is so barbarous and morose that does not perceive himself in some sort struck with its attraction. Beautiful people are like so many pictures moving about in society for the innocent gratification of beholders. And with this superiority to other pictures that they are alive and present continual variety, it attracts others, makes it easier to secure friends. A comely face and form are an introduction to notice and favor. In a ruler, a preacher, any leader in society, it is an element of influence. It is not therefore to be despised either by its possessor or by others. The early riser. Sleep is a very good natural blessing and is desirable. It is sweet to a man and what he should be thankful for, yet should not indulge himself in the neglect of the proper business of life, not to be used but at the proper time for it. For the highs is made for sight and not for sleep only, and should not be kept shut and inattentive to business, which must necessarily end in poverty and want. Persons that indulge themselves and sleep to excess not only lose the time which they spend therein, but contract a listless, indolent disposition and habit, and are generally half asleep or never well awake, and therefore, of course, come to poverty. Morning is a fit and the best season for private duties. What would one not give to have been? during the stillness of those grey morning hours, purpled calm, exalted anticipations of the work which lay immediately before them. Morning is the time freest from distractions and company. Colonel Gardiner used constantly to rise at four in the morning and to spend his time till six in the sacred exercises of the closet, reading, meditation and prayer. 
in which last he acquired such a fervency of spirit, says his biographer, I believe few men living ever attained. This certainty very much contributed to strengthen that firm faith in God and reverent, animating sense of his presence for which he was so eminently remarkable and which carried him through the trials and services of life with such steadiness and with such activity. For he indeed endured and acted as if always seen him who is invisible. If at any time he was obliged to get out before six in the morning, he rose proportionally sooner, so that when a journey or a march has required him to be on horseback by four, he would, at his, he would be at his devotions by two. The morning is favorable to devotion. Our minds are not yet disturbed by the cares of the day. Dr. Doddridge tells us that to his habit of early rising, the world is indebted for nearly the whole of his valuable works. The well-known Bishop Barnett was an habitual early riser, for when at college, his father aroused him to his studies every morning at four o'clock, and he continued the practice during the remainder of his life. Sir Thomas More equally also made it is invariable practice to rise always at four. And if we turn our attention to royalty, we have, amongst others, the example of Peter the Great, who, whether at work in the docks at London as a ship carpenter, or at Hanville as a blacksmith, or on the throne of Russia, always rose before daylight. It has been said, the morning is the friend to the muses, and it is no less so to the graces. Public business in the East is always transacted early in the morning. A king sits an hour or more to hear courses or receive petitions in a court held anciently, and in many places still, in the open air, at the city gateways a show of self-denial and diligence. Time Management Time has been defined as the consideration of duration, the measure of it, as set out by certain periods and marked by certain measures. Time is an estate, indeed, which will produce nothing without cultivation, but which will always abundantly repay the labors of industry and satisfy the most extensive desires. If no part of it be suffered to lie waste by negligence, to be overrun with noxious plants, or laid out for show rather than use, time has an important relation and bearing to a king. It means the period of his life, his opportunities of evil or good, a trust and a talent confided to his care. There are many allurements and temptations that will lead a king away from the proper improvement of time. The sentiment is that we ought to be solicitous and solicitous rather to improve our time to some useful purpose because there are in an evil world so many temptations to waste it. Watch the time and make it your own so as to control it. As merchants look out for opportunities and accurately choose out the best goods Save not the time, but command it, and it shall do what you approve. The days of life in general are so exposed to evil as to make it necessary to make the most of the seasonable opportunity so long as it lasts. A careful and diligent use of time and an improvement of it 
to the best advantage shows that it is valuable and precious and it's not to be trifled with and squandered away and be lost as it may be for it can neither be recalled nor prolonged and taking it for an opportunity of doing good to ourselves or others it signifies that no opportunity of discharging our duty to God and society and of doing good either to the bodies of our souls or to that of men should be neglected but even all risks should be run and means used to enjoy time study the merchants as he employs capital wisely and find him sedulously attentive to all his worldly interests so arranging all his business and regulating all the affairs of traffic that he knows how he stands in the world how carefully the farmer prepares the seed and the ground early and late in season his watchfulness is ever alive his cares never cease and while he looks for the dew and hair and light of heaven to bless his fields with abundance and joy the pale student with his presentations often by the midnight lamp he ransacks tombs of ancient or illustrious dead he never tires in the pursuit of important knowledge the philosophers test by science and reason the mysteries of nature and the noble perseverance it draws forth some secret into the full daylight of knowledge the wise statesman studies the complicated webs of political or moral life and penetrates with the keen eye of sagacity the undercurrents of human government and the bearings of moral action hence he is an economist of time so much time has gone by and cannot be recalled a dying english queen cried a world of money for an inch of time the span of life shatters continually the minutes of life are all upon the wing hastening to be gone as in money so in time we are to look chiefly to the smallest portions to take care of the pens and the pounds will take care of themselves take care of the minutes and the hours and years will take care of themselves a king must make a sustained effort to get opportunity for it will be needed opportunities are only too apt to slip by unrecognized even the wisest of us is hardly wise enough to recognize his opportunities to their past these opportunities critical as they are when once they are gone can never be recalled but if we set ourselves to seize and redeem present opportunities we shall need to remember that they are only to be redeemed at a certain cost if it be hard to subdue passion and the cravings of irregular desire today it will be harder tomorrow should we leave the hours of today unimproved hard and evil times indeed bring opportunities of a special value not only because they are scarce but also because they have a great intrinsic worth we all complain of the shortness of time and yet we have more than we know what to do with we are always complaining that our days are few and acting as though there will be no end of them queen elizabeth except when engaged by public or domestic affairs and the exercises necessary for the preservation of our health and spirits 
was always employed neither in reading or writing either in reading or writing in translating from other authors or in the compositions of our own there is however one mode of acting in summer another in winter even with greater labor in the former than in the latter a king must seek instruction from God to estimate his days aright, their number, the rapidity with which they pass away, the liability to be cut down, the certainty that they must soon come to an end, their bearing on the future of state of being. If anyone knew when and where and how he was to die, it might be presumed that this would exert an important influence on him in forming his plans and on his general manner of life. We have not enough time at our disposal to justify us in misspending a single quarter of an hour. Neither are we sure of enough of life to justify us in procrastinating for a moment. If we were wise in heart, we should see this, but mere head wisdom will not guide us aright. A king must have a practical impression The life is temporary and preparative. All men think of mortal but themselves. Like the wise merchants, we must frequently take stock in order to see where we stand. Man is dangerously apt to forget this numbering. He allows the days to slip away unnoticed. We must pay an observant regard to our days as they pass away. Days, weeks and years are but landmarks. No man ever went through a night watch in a sick room when time was measured by the sufferer's breathing or the intolerable tickling of the clock without a firmer grasp on the realities of life and time. An Italian philosopher expressed in his motto that time was his estate, an estate indeed, that will produce nothing without cultivation, but will always repay abundantly the labors of industry and satisfy the most extensive desires. If no part of it be suffered to lie waste by negligence, to be overrun by noxious plants, or laid out for show rather than for use, time is our opportunity to estimate human life by the purpose to which it should be applied. It should be measured by the eternity to which it leads. The shortness of life should teach us to be speedy and diligent in doing all things as we ought to do. The immortal Alfred, one of the best of kings that ever filled the British throne, divided his time into three portions, allotting eight hours to sleep, recreation and meals, eight to public business and eight to private study and devotion. And by constantly adhering to his plan, he accomplished the works and acquired the wisdom which have excited the administration and admiration of posterity. Oh, that some of us, instead of calculating our days by any earthly timepiece, may calculate them by the numbers of opportunities and mercies we are burning down and burning out. Never to be relighted. While time lingers for you, improve it. Conscientiously set apart its hours as they come to the highest purpose. Time is precious because we have much business on our hands. Business which relates 
not to our bodies only, but to our souls. Not merely to this life, but to the whole duration of our existence. Time is short and uncertain, and our work must be done soon, or it can never be done at all. The greater part of it is gone already. What remains is increased in value, and it is contracted in length. We had none to waste at first. We have need to be frugal now. Time past indeed cannot be recalled. Each moment which flies off is gone forever and will return no more. Like the wind, it passes away and comes not again. But we do the best we can today and towards the recovery of lost time when we reflect with sorrows on follies past and resolve to be wise in future. A king must enter into his own work speedily and attend to it with diligence. A versatile humor is active but wants patience. It flies from object to object too rapidly to appropriate or retain any. Time is lost because nothing is prosecuted to effect. An excessive fondness for company and amusement is the cause of much waste of time. Do every work in its season, attend with its discretion to the cause of duty, and you will save much time and prevent much loss. It is so in your worldly business. Make a good arrangement of its parts and take up each part in its order. And you will execute the all with facility and success. While your improvident neighbor who leaves all his matters in confusion and takes hold of his business as it happens and usually at the wrong hand is always embarrassed with cares, straightened for time, and disappointed in the results. Adversity makes men serious. Some are so bad and fraught that they would take away liberty, estates, even life itself from you. And with it all, occasions of doing and receiving good. You carry your own lives in your hands. Before means and opportunities be wholly lost, redeem the time. As you cannot overtake time, the best way is always to be a few minutes before him. We may see the power of time from the lives of men who have carved their way from obscurity to fame. They achieve success entirely from perseveringly employing spare moments wasted by others. The wealth of time is like gold in the mine, like the gem in the pebble, like the diamond in the deep. The mine must be worked, the pebble ground and polished, the deep fathomed and searched. Time is life's frightage, wherewith some men trade and make a fortune, and others suffer it to motor away or waste in extravagance. Time is life's presentation, out of which some extracts wondrous wisdom, while others let it lie uncovered and then die fools. Time is life's tree, from which some gather precious fruits, while others lie down under its shadow and perish with hunger. Time is life's ladder, whereby some raise themselves up to honor and renown and glory, and some let themselves down into the deeps of shame, degradation, ignominy. Time will be to us what, by our use of the treasure we make it, a good or an evil, a blessing or a curse. A king must be cautious in respect of his recreations. No man can pretend to redeem his time who is not exceedingly careful about it. A great portion of time is spent by some persons in foolish sports or pastimes, as they call them, 
A king must retire from the world very often, abandon all company, and be alone. Company devours time excessively, and your greatest company keepers are the worst managers of time. When abroad, a king must not mix with evil companions. Be very circumspect as to the persons you converse with. Never think you can redeem time. If you be careless as to his particular, for a wonderful deal of time is lost in unprofitable and sinful society. Lewd women. The immoderate love of women is the most destructive to kings and kingdoms. Strength of body is weakened by an excessive use of venery with a multi multi multiplicity of women and strength of mind and reason and wisdom which is impaired by the conversation which such persons whereby time is consumed and lost which should be spent in the improvement of knowledge. A king is enjoined not to surrender his life, his conduct and actions to the influence of women, who both by dissipation and sensuality which they occasion, and the quarrels which they provoke, and the evil counsels which they give, often ruin kings and states. A king must avoid the one who though she pretends ardent love and kindness to thee, Yet in truth is one of the most cruel creatures in the world, wasting your estate and body without the least pity. And when the casting thee off with scorn and contempt, and when our interest requires it, taking away your very life, of which there are innumerable examples and damning thy soul forever. Though all the blandishments of love dwell on the tongue and excess of fondness appear in the old demeanor of the seductress, yet cruelty has its throne in our hearts, and they will rob a mother when it appears answered to their hands. Those who give their strength, their wealth, and their years to them. She speaks like a friend and hugs like an enemy. And will surely turn against thee when thy money is spent. Wise men fall, great men fall. Thus was it with Hercules and Omphel. The latter was the queen of Lydia, and Hercules fell in love with her, and became her slave for three years, and led an effeminate life in winding and carving wool, while Omphel wore the skin of the tremendous naming lion. He, Hercules, had slain. He had squeezed the lion to death, and Omphil pressed out his manhood in a embrace. Thus it was with Antony and Cleopatra. Thus it was with Henry the Fourth of France. Few, like Ulysses, have passed in safety the Hall of Sirens. Few escaped Calypso. The seductress will strip a king from the honors he possesses, from the health he enjoys, and from the peace and tranquility of mind he feels. It concerns a king to get and use discretion that he may be able to resist those manifold temptations to which he is exposed after a short pleasure follows long pain by the impairing men's health, strength, estates and credits which they cannot reflect upon without trouble and vexation. Remorse or conscience and anguish of spirit for like a sword that cuts on both sides she wounds both mind and body. There is so much danger of being drawn aside by lewd women. The kisses of whose lips are compliments and songs are as pleasing to the carnal senses of men as honey is sweet to the taste. 
she promises a great deal of pleasure in her embraces and in the enjoyment of her. Her mouth is smoother than oil. Her fair speeches, enticing words and flattering phoning language and amorous expressions easily find their way and slide into the hearts of men to prevail upon them to listen to her and you to her temptations. It is a shame to a man to allow himself to be deceived by a vain, shallow-minded woman, to permit a mere selfish temptress to beguile him, to prevent him from entertaining the true and wise thoughts in his mind, to hinder him by her artifices from reflecting on what is the path of life and what the way of death. It is a shame to a man to surrender his manly virtue to one so utterly undeserving of his honor. He who yields to the solicitations of the temptress, to the impulses of a vicious nature, is forfeiting his honor, is resigning his true manhood, is a son of shame. Lewd women are generally very talkative. No words have greater force in them to persuade men to sin than the flatteries of the strange woman. Neither worldly discretion, nor a good education, nor moral precepts, nor any other considerations are sufficient preservatives against these lusts, as is manifest from daily experience. Though she pretends love, yet in truth is one of the most cruel creatures in the world, wasting your estate and body without the least pity. Wealth gotten by your employments, now in the possession of a strange family, whose house and table are furnished with the fruit of your care and your labors. A king must avoid a strange woman who is full of crafty devices to ensnare men, and by gifts or lascivious actions she holds them in cruel bondage, so that they have neither power nor will to forsake her, notwithstanding all the dangers and mischiefs which they know attend upon such practices. To be ensnared by an adulterous woman brings not only such diseases of body as are both painful and scandalous, but such horrors into the conscience, all the schemes and controversies of her harlots are to ensnare men by her wanton looks and lascivious gestures, and when she has got them, she holds them fast. It is a very difficult thing and a very rare one ever to get out of her hands. Where women are, evils there are found. The presence of bad women in society is the great temptation to which men are liable and the great test by which they are tried. Men's folly and madness arise generally from the seductions of the female sex. One might fill a large page with proverbs and gnomies uttered in disparagement of women by men of all ages and countries. If the malign sex had equal liberty, the tables might have been reversed. And what is said of the bitterness of the wicked woman and of the mischief she does in society remain ever true. But there are states of society in which good women are as numerous as good men and in which their influence is equally beneficial. Delights with a wife A king is limited to lawful delights. A woman is fiercer than all beasts of the pre. A wife is for life and to be lived with joyfully, not for a short time, but all the days of life. One of the ways of enjoying life comfortably 
and one of the people one that if a man has a wife whom he ought to love himself as his own flesh to take delight in her company be pleasant with her and rejoice in her there is calm peacefulness in life of a happy home the wife is a blessing and a comfort to the man and not a curse and a snare as a halot would be make the wife happy by keeping her and from others by behaving in a loving affable and respectful manner to her by living comfortably with her and providing well for her and her children she must neither be despised nor divorced even in old age but delight in her company now as ever express a joy and pleasure in her a king must be overwhelmed with her beauty and desires of her company he must couple his heart with her so closely knit and join together in love that they have but one heart and can never be separated a woman of faculty who a king is satisfied comes with the tranquility of a perfect assurance a non squandra of her husband's goods but a fountain of good and good only her words glowing with the calm flame of love happy the man who after long years of wedded life can repeat the estimate of his early love with a calm certitude born of experience the woman who has made her home bright and has won and kept her husband's love and children's reverence it were well for the next generation if young women of this one were as solicitous to make cages as nests to cultivate qualities which would keep love in a home as to cultivate attractions which lure him to their feet a woman of strong firm and excellent mind a woman of might power and capacity she is not willful strong passionate selfish but humble respect dutiful affectionate the reputation is that of an ideal woman the perfect housewife the chaste helpmate of her husband upright god-fearing economical wise devoted women unselfish women domesticated women are not too easily discovered the working class girls find their work so heavy and so long that they have not strength of body or leisure of soul to learn what belongs to wifehood and motherhood nothing so damps the horror and joy of a man or his children as an incompetent faulty woman at the head of the household and can nothing be a greater source of strength than the woman who gives an impulse to all that is good and right and checks the evil by a significant look or a softly spoken word if the future race of men is to be strong and the present race of women must be first strong a woman's first duty is to please and a woman who does not please has missed her hand in life good women are very scarce and many that seem to be so do not prove so the husband is the head of the household but a wife's position does not imply inferiority she is a husband's companion in life and for life to be regarded by him as his equal the husband is the breadwinner the wife is the bread keeper and distributor in all the affairs of domestic life the wife should maintain a position and influence she should ensure her authority by proving her ability to do what the office of a wife demands 
Never for a moment permit your husband to feel that he may not trust the concerns of home to your care. Act in such a way that instinctively he will know his property, his honor, his happiness are safe in your hands. Genuine wifely love seeks the good of her husband. Is constant as nature. Here is elevating influence. Her words have inspired her husband with honorable ambitions and her diligence and frugality have contributed the means by which to reach his lofty aims. She is his stay and confidence. Woman's strength may be in her tongue even more than in her arms and hands. This edge to growing sharper by constant use must be consecrated, else it will kill more than kill. The ideal woman uses a good sense to advantage in a management home. Nothing is more worthy of one's most acute thoughts than the inconspicuous duties of the home. A business enterprise is not a sign of our seeking new interest outside the home, but on the contrary, a sign of our greater devotion to it. Home over everything, everything for the home, is her idea. Mrs. Henry Clay, the wife of the celebrated American statesman, during her husband's long and frequent absences from the home at the seat of government, used to take the reins into her own hands at the farm. She made a practical study of agriculture, oversaw the overseer, and became an oracle among the farmers of the neighborhood. Preparatory to Mr. Clay's departure from home, she invariably received from him a handsome check, which she regularly restored to him upon his return, with a laconic remark that she found no use for it. A king celebrates his queen for her beauty, though she holds it all to him, for her comely parts and gracefulness, which he describes with wonder, for her dress, her garments, though they are his own, for her faith, love, humility, and other graces, though they are his gifts. The Hell of Beaconsfield said, Every step in my life to honor and success I hold to my good and faithful wife. President Lincoln, on receiving a presentation, said, I will hand this to the lady who, by her counsel and help, has made it possible in any wise for me to serve my country. A working man at a great meeting said recently, My wife was a good woman before her conversion but now she is worth her weight in diamonds. And when Jonathan Edwards was discharged from his appointment, he came home in despair. But his wife smiled bravely and said, My dear, you have often longed for leisure to write your presentation, and now it is come. I have lighted a fire in your room and set the table with pens and paper. He was so chaired that he set to once and wrote the presentation that made him famous. Instead of being an hindrance to her husband's advancement, she fathers it. Her influence for good extends to him also. Having no domestic anxieties, he is set free to do his part in public life. A king is observed and respected not only for his own worth, but for his wife's sake, not only for those rich ornaments which by our care and diligence she provides for him, which others of his fellows by reason of their wife's sloth or luxury are not able to procure, but also for his wisdom in choosing and his happiness in enjoying so excellent a wife by whose prudent care in the management of his domestic concerns, he has perfect freedom 
wholly to attend upon public affairs. A king is delighted with the freedom from anxiety and distraction, and for being the husband of such a woman, who, taking such care of domestic affairs, is more at leisure to attend public business and transact with reputation. Such a woman advances her husband's interests, increases his influence, and by attending to his domestic concerns, enables him to take his share in public matters, so that his name is in great repute in popular assemblies at the city gates. The excellence of his wife not only makes him rich, but important and famous. Wine. The body stands in need of drink as well as of meat. A king eats to refresh and strengthens his nature for strength and not for gluttony, that he may be fit for action and business. To sit in council or in any court of judicature, wine cherishes and refreshes when a body is weak and languishing. As wine is given to cure the infirm and fainting, so likewise to cheer and delight the sound and healthy. It is lawful to drink it not only for necessity, but sometimes for pleasure. The craving for a fuller, richer life, for hours in which we rise above ourselves and pass the normal and customary limitations of our powers, is a natural craving. Some people drink, not so much for the sake of personal excitement, as for the sake of good fellowship. They never drink much when they are alone, and when they are in company, they drink to excess because, as the heat of intoxication increases, it seems to thaw and dissolve all reserve. Conversations flow more freely and becomes more frank. Mind touches more closely. Lives which had been isolated from each other blend and flow in a common channel. Intoxication, at least, in its early stages gives excitement. It exalts the activity both of intellect and emotion. Thought becomes more vivid and more rapid. The colors of imaginations become more brilliant. The whole physical nature becomes more animated. The river of life, which had sunk low and had been moving sluggishly, suddenly rises because of a rushing flood and overflows its banks. Drinking wine for necessary use or honest delights and love of pleasures is not prohibited. But excessive drinking of it, otherwise a king may be overtaken and intoxicated through ignorance of the strength of the liquor and their own weakness. Excessive drinking deprives persons of the use of reason, though not always. It is an abuse of the creature. It hurts the mind, memory and judgment, deprives of reason, and sets a man below a beast. It brings diseases on the body and wastes the estate. It unfits for business and duty. It exposes to shame and danger, and therefore should be carefully avoided, and especially by a king. It is the fall to vigilance and earnestness, and it leads all who yield to it to act unwisely. There is in fact but one thing that produces intoxication. It is alcohol, the poisonous substance produced by fermentation. This substance is neither created nor changed, increased nor diminished by distillation. It exists in the cider, the beer, and the wine after they are fermented, and the whole process of distillation consists in driving it off by it and collecting it in a concentrated form and so that it may be preserved. But distilling will make it not change it. Alcohol is precisely the same thing in the wine that is in the brandy after it is distilled. 
in the cider or the beer, that it's in the whiskey or the rum? And why is it right to become intoxicated on it in one form rather than the other? Since therefore there is danger of intoxication in the use of wine, as well as in the use of ardent spirits, why should we not abstain from one as well as from the other? How can a man prove that it is right for him to drink alcohol in the form of wine, and that it is wrong for him to drink it in the form of brandy or rum? For drunkenness is the effect and cause of utter recklessness. It is the effect of self-abandonment by which the sensual or passionate elements of the nature are simulated to frenzy, while the self-controlling judgment is drugged to sleep. It is the cause of yet greater recklessness, for as these passions and appetites become jaded, they need stronger and stronger stimulants to the old nature, bodily and mental, is lost in delirium or stupor. The entire dissoluteness of mind and manners and such a course of life is void of counsel and prudent intention. Drunkenness causes injury to the body and estates of men, name and reputation, wrath and fury, slaughter and bloodshed, lust and lewdness. Wine immoderately drank makes a mark of a king and deprives him of his understanding and causes him to speak and act like a fool and thereby renders him ridiculous and exposes him to shame, contempt and insult. Though it pretends to be a sociable thing, it renders a king unfit for society, making him abusive with his tongue and outrageous in his passions. Wine deceives a king, and it's not only of him before he's aware, but it promises him a pleasure which it not give. But on the contrary, excess drinking gives him pain, and so mocks him. It exposes him to reproach and disgrace, and to the mockery and derisions of others, as well as it sets him to scoff at his companions and even to mock at religion and all that is good and serious, and strong drink not only disturbs the brain and puts the spirit in a ferment so that the king rages within, but it sets him living and quarreling with his company and everybody he meets with. Such generally gets into brawls and contentions and get woe, sorrow and wounds. Drunkenness causes a king to forget his royal dignity and to use too much familiarity with persons of low life and of an ill behavior. Drunkenness and sensuality are in us, especially in rulers. It is a sad challenge that it should be given to bottles of wine. Nobles and princes and great courtiers are ordinarily great plagues and snares to kings. When men not only become brutish themselves, but they invite and tempt others to do the same excess of riot and by all means draw themselves to drunkenness. Stimulants and feeble reason pervert the heart and do suit rulers who need clear and steady minds and well-governed affections. It is very disgraceful to any man to drink immoderately, to make a beast of himself and much more a king or a judge who of all men ought to be grave and sober, both that they may perform their office well and maintain the grandeur and dignity of it, which otherwise would become useless and despicable. The evils of intemperance flagrant enough in the case, in the case of a person are greatly enhanced in the case of a king, whose misdeeds may affect the whole community. Because there is no secret where drunkenness reigns, drunkenness opens all the sanctuaries of nature and discovers the nakedness of the soul, all of its weaknesses and follies. It multiplies sins and covers them. It makes a man incapable of being a private friend, public counsellor. It makes a soul into slavery and imprisonment 
more than any vice whatsoever. Big disarms a man of all his reason and of all his wisdom. Whereby he might be cured. And therefore, commonly, it grows upon him with age. A drunkard, being still more a fool and less a man. You shall be leaders in a world of thoughts. You shall as gods. You shall open men's eyes to the reality of things. Beware of the strong drink, of sense-bound intellectuality. Let it not be part of kings to drink. Let them not have any business therewith, as if it belonged to their calling. Craftsmanship Skill in handicraft is a species of mental excellence and deserves the name wisdom. So, with natural talents, with the poetic gifts, gifts of music, painting, sculpture, architecture, business faculty, the gift of statesmanship, the power to think out inventions, the skill of the artificer are all gifts from God. A king is to possess that wonderful dexterity of hand on which the power of artistic execution mainly depends. He is naturally endowed with a mechanical genius with a great knowledge and skill in the useful as well as liberal hearts, so as to be a first-class artisan. A king has such a share of knowledge of what is to be wrought, such wisdom and understanding in the ingenious and curious manner of working them, that even if he did not work with his own hands, yet could teach, guide and direct others how to do them. And this is not an ordinary but an extraordinary gift of knowledge of these things. Nor is it all into a fruitful invention, not to long study and contrivance, but it is by the immediate inspiration of God. A king has the power to invent and originate, the ability to receive and appreciate directions and suggestions, and such information as is acquired by experience and acquaintance with facts, it possesses manual dexterity, the power of artistic execution. Every man should be permitted, as far as possible, to follow the bent direction of his own genius. When it is gently leads him to new inventions and improvements on old plans, how much has both the labor of men and cattle been by improvements of in machinery. And can we say that the wisdom which found out these improvements did not come from a higher authority, namely God? No man, by cause of reading or study ever, acquired a genius of this kind. We call it natural and say it was born with a man. Who taught Newton to ascertain the laws by which the universe is governed? through which discovery new source of profit and pleasure has been open to mankind through every part of the civilized world. No reading, no study, no example formed his genius. God, who made him, gave him that compass and bent of mind by which he made those discoveries and for which his name is celebrated in the earth. When I see Napier inventing the logarithms, Copernicus, Descartes, and Kepler contributing to pull down the four systems of the universe, and Newton demonstrating the true one. And when I see the long list of the patentees of useful inventions, by whose industry and skill long and tedious processes in the necessary hearts of life have been shortened, labor greatly lessened, and much time and expense saved. I then see with Moses, men who are wise-hearted, whom God has filled with the spirit of wisdom for these very purposes, that he might help man by man, that as time rolls on, he might give to his intelligent creatures such proofs of his being, infinitely varied wisdom and gracious providence, 
as should cause them to depend on him and give him that glory which is due to his name. Technology is to help man, not to render him useless. The man has a hand and is the greatest and most perfect machine. Let it not be laid aside. In our zeal for machinery, we are rendering all the lower classes useless, filling the land with beggary and vice, and the workhouses with paupers, ruining the husbandmen with oppressive poor rates. Keep machinery as a help to the human hand, to lighten the labor, but never let it supersede either. The Western Hemisphere are pushing technology to a destructive extreme. By inspiration of such wisdom, the understanding from God, how many dark ages of the world have been brought to light, how many names of men and places, how many customs and hearts that were lost restored, and by their names, a few busts, images, stones, bricks, coins, rings, and culinary utensils, the remaining wrecks of long past centuries have supplied the place of written documents and cast a profusion of light on the history of man and the history of providence. And let me add that the providence which preserved these materials and raised up men to decipher and explain them is itself gloriously by illustrated by them. Good counsel. A king must give good counsel unto others on how they ought to bear trials and deliver important maxim to them on the great subjects of the divine government, their duty to an another and to all their fellow creatures, to teach instruct and comfort others is not only a king's duty but his praise. A king with the inspiration of a higher authority possesses quick sagacity and a piercing judgment to discern dubious and difficult cases that his resolutions and decrees may be received like oracles and all causes be decided by him so justly and exactly that no man may be wronged in the judgment it passes. A king's words have in people's minds the certainty and importance of a divine oracle, putting an end to all controversy or division or opinion. Honorable and great men lose nothing of their honor and greatness by descending to the instruction of others. Though they are inferiors, the words of the wise mighty power, the strength prevalency in them making of war most of the wars that are undertaken are wars of justice ambition and aggrandizement the caprice which could have had no previous good counsel a minister who is perhaps neither a good nor a great man counsels his king to make war the cabinet must be brought into it, and a sufficient number out of the states of a kingdom gained over to support it. By and by, what was begun through caprice must be maintained through necessity. Places must be created, and offices must be filled with needed dependents, whose interests may be protracted for the war till they get enough to pay their debts and secure independence for life. And for these important ends, the blood of the country is spilled and the treasures of the people exhausted. There are justifiable wars, but even these may be carried on with folly, reckless disregard of human life. Warlike expeditions are not to be undertaken without great deliberation. It should be maturely considered whether the war ought to be begun or not, whether it be just, whether it be prudent, and when it is begun, how and by what hearts it may be successfully prosecuted. The way to bring our purposes and desires to a good effect is to man with serious considerations and good advice. 
it is necessary in every common undertaking, and much more in a thing of which is of high importance. War should not be entered upon rashly, without first considering whether there is just and lawful cause of it, and without consulting the necessary charge and expense of it. Whether the sufficiency of men and money to carry it on, and what may probably be the issue of it, it is right in a king to advise with the privy council or with the chief council of the nation. But above all, both he and his people should seek advice of a higher authority on such an occasion. Not that it should be any doubt with whether we should engage in such war, but we should advise with experienced soldiers, and especially with God, what weapons to take and how to use them, and consider in whose name and strength we are to fight and inquire and learn the force, methods, and designs of the enemy, and where to guard against them or attack them. Even the most prudent of men need friends' counsel, and none but the most conceited would deem himself superior to advice, or would fail to allow that. This is true in all relations of life, in great and small matters alike in peace as our moralist hearts in war war is a necessary evil but it must be undertaken prudently and with a due consideration of circumstance and means character for other things being equal a king's force in the world is just in proportion to the fullness of his heart Heart is power. Thoughts are the prime movers of the whole human conduct. Many regard thoughts as exempted from all control. To the supreme being, thoughts bear the character of good or evil as much as actions. When thoughts are indulged with deliberation and complacency, a king must study to acquire the habit of attention of to thoughts. Acquire the power of fixing your minds and of restraining their regular notions. Guard against idleness, which is the great fomenter of all corruptions in human hearts. It is the parent of loose imaginations and inordinate desires. Provide honorable employment for the native activity of your minds. When criminal thoughts arise, attain to all the proper methods of speedily suppressing them. A king must gain the power of self-denial, which consists in our being ready, on proper occasions, to abstain from pleasures, or to submit to sacrificing for the sake of duty or conscience, or from a view to some higher or more extensive good. When you are surrounded with an abundance of worldly enjoyments, there is something in prosperity that tends to intoxicate the mind. When under provocations from your fellow creatures, these are very trying periods, and the spirit that is in us often lusts to resentments and retaliation. Do not be too sensitive to these injuries. When your hands are fraudly business, we walk in the midst of snares. When you are engaged in diversions and recreations, very many are in excess given to pleasure. Make it the main business of their existence. Guard your character with more carefulness than you do your most precious possessions. For it needs continual watchfulness and our tenant will go to rack and ruin. That garden is plainly imposed as necessary by the very constitution of our manhood. Our nature is evidently not a republic but a monarchy. It is full of blind impulses and hungry desires which take no heed of any law but their own satisfaction. If the reins are thrown on the necks of these untamed horses, they will drag the man to destruction. They are only safe when they are 
curbed and bitted and held well in. Then there are tastes and inclinations which need this and are plainly meant to be subordinate. The will is to guard the lower self and conscience is to govern the will. Omitably, there are parts of every man's nature which are meant to serve and parts which are appointed to rule and to let the servants usurp the place of the rulers is to bring about as wild a confusion within the ecclesiast lamented that he had seen in anarchic times when he wrote princes walking and beggars on horseback. As George Herbert has it, give not thy humours away, God gave them to thee on a lock and key. If in the very garrison are traitors, how shall the fortress be defended? If then we are to exercise an effectual guard of our characters, control over our natures, we must have an outward standard of right and wrong which shall not be deflected by variations in our temperature. We need a fixed light to stare towards which is stable on the stable shore and is not tossing up and down on our decks. The fountains and wells of the east were watched over with special care. A king must keep his mind from vanity, the understanding from error, and the will from perseverance. The conscience clear of guilt, the affections from being inordinate and set on evil objects. The thoughts from being employed on bad leaders and the whole from falling into the hands of the enemy. We have liberty of thinking and may choose our own thoughts. It is in our power to determine what suggestions we will fix our minds upon. A king must avoid two things idleness and lose company. He must be as attentive as possible to the first motions of his mind, so that when he find them turning towards something that is forbidden, he may stop them at once. A okay. must settle his thoughts on due objects, bend his inclinations into a right frame, constrain his affections within due bounds, ground his purposes on honest reasons, and direct them onto lawful matters. His thoughts must qualify his opinions of others, make wise and prudent judgments, reform his life and regulate his devotions and enable him to properly govern his people. There are many traitors in the camp. Active steps must be taken to ensure against mischief makers. A king must engage in virtuous industry we are formed for actions, and when the powers are not employed in something worthy, they are likely to find employment in another sort. A king must guard against the mouth, the lips. They are to be corrected of every crooked false expression. What wonderful variety of expression is the mouth capable of firmness, laxity, tenderness, scorn, love, irony, hate. In controlling the mouth, we do something to control the earth. Its contents must be purified from falsehood, coarseness, foolish jesting, malicious gossip, all of which tell upon the central consciousness and disturb and obscure it. The eyes are to be trained to a direct, straightforward expression. The leer of lust, the oblique glance of cunning expressed on the faces of others, or the clear honest light beaming from the eyes of the pure and open-hearted, not only mirror the heart, but remind how the heart may be reached by the self-discipline of the high. The feet are likewise to be trained to a straightforward walk, even in moments of relaxation, till it was well to have an object for a walk. The mind needs self-direction and discipline even in its pleasures, otherwise it becomes dissolute and waywardly falls into evil through sheer laxity in the spring of wills. Legacy The happiness of a land depends on the character of its rulers. The people cannot be happy when their princes are childish and lovers of pleasure. 
slothfulness is of ill consequence both to private and public affairs. A land is happy when it is governed by a king that is not only descended from a race of heroes and illustrious men, and has a princely education, but that he imitates his ancestors and treads in their steps, and is famous himself for wisdom, for virtue and real piety, in which true nobility consists. A king who is of an ingenious mind has princely virtues and qualifications, who is wise and prudent, skillful in the affairs of government and assiduous and industrious therein. Orderliness A king must conduct his affairs in an appropriate and becoming manner, generously without confusion, discord, tumult. Order is commended in the conduct of affairs, in the distribution of time, in the management of fortune, in the regulation of amusements, and in the arrangement of society. Health and hygiene. A king must always keep away from bad habits and from personal neglect or impunity. Bodily health. The chief elements in all prosperity must be preserved and exercised modesty, the greater caution of which is to avoid all real moral uncleanness. Discipline. Temptations are everywhere. Our foes compass us like bees, evils of many sorts seduce. Life is not a playground, but an arena of grim, earnest fighting. No man does right in his sleep. No man does right without a struggle. Our nature is not a democracy, but a kingdom. In us all, there are passions, desires, affections, all of which may lead to vice or to virtue, and all of which evidently call out for direction, for cultivation, and often for repression. Self-reverence, self-knowledge, self-control lead to life to sovereign power, a king must exercise control over his passions and especially his anger to prevent manifold dangers and mischiefs. A king must have rule over his affections, put restraint to them and guard against them to curb his curiosity, to check his pride and vanity, to restrain his wrath and anger and revenge and keep within due bounds his ambition and each of vainglory. A Chinese maxim says, who can govern himself is fit to govern the world. The source of fickleness and inconstancy is weakness of judgment, sometimes timidity, and sometimes the keenness of all passions are in a man continually into new pursuits according as they have happened to be excited in their turns. When the propensity to desire renders the temper keen and eager, if we lay it under no restraint, it must engage us in trifling and vicious pursuits. In respect of the object of our pursuits, whether pleasure, profit or power, it must render us crave satiable ever unsatisfied with what we have obtained, wishing and plotting for more, and in respect of the means of prosecution, it must render us impetuous and violent, regardless of the bounds of right, impatient of every delay and opposition. That vice, be it what it will, to which our particular temper directly leads us, is an enemy already advanced to the gaze of the heart, and if it finds the heart like a city without walls, it enters at its pleasure. We can make no resistance. It is only setting yourselves at once to govern it for all its perversities that you can lay an act root of the tree and effectively kill all the branches. No man can be said to have attained complete rule of his own spirit who has not under his habitual control the ten thoughts, the language of his lips, emotions of lust and appetite, and the energy of his passion.
when we reflect also that every licentious principle, every criminal project, and every atrocious deed is the fruit of a distempered fancy, whose rovings were originally unchecked till thoughts grew into desires, desires ripened into resolves, and resolves terminated into execution. Well, may we tremble at discovering how feeble is the control over our imaginations which we have eternally acquired. Many a crime which stains human nature was generated in the retirement of the closets, in the hours of idle and listless thoughts. Perhaps over the pages of a poisonous presentation or during the contemplation of a licentious picture. Talkativeness, the venial offspring of a lively, not to say unrestrained fancy, hardly rises to a fault till it is found that he who talks incessantly must often talk foolishly, and that the prattle of a vain and itching tongue degenerates rapidly into the foolish talking and jesting which, as an apostle says, are not convenient. To distinguish between self-control and apathy, and to show its consistency with being zealously affected in a good cause, a king must avoid intemperance of feeling, especially angry feeling, extravagance of speech, rashness of conduct. The lack of self-control exposes us to insults and dishonor, the machinations of the foes, and altered destitution and ruin. Oppositions A king is bestowed with firmness. In spite of his people's opposition, he possesses true courage, constancy, and manly courage to edge his own tools, to cut into the other's metal. No opposition should be able to outface a king or to look him out of countenance. He should behave with an undaunted spirit and with great integrity amidst all opposition to him. The boldness of a king is a strictly supernatural gift. Whatever persistence may be in evil, he will be able to meet it, perhaps to overcome it by a greater persistency in good. A king is excellently endowed with qualifications that he might sway the sceptre and rule the people with equity. A king should possess the grandeur of kings and kingdom, him to be exalted above the ordinary majesty of other kingdoms, that is his kingdom equaled, if not excelled. The greatest neighbor kingdoms and are kings in riches and power. His kingdom over all kingdoms should be like a mighty tree that overtops all the forest. A king should produce many who are fit to hold sceptres to be kings, rulers and governors, highly to subdue kingdoms, for example, leaving behind several sons who became kings besides other princes of the blood who seem to be strong rods, fit for sceptres or sceptres bearers. Concluding Remarks Thus ends the several parts of the ruler's creed by King Adegoke. It is a work that should be studied by all, both old and young. The former will find in it real truths, gathered by experience and already tested by themselves, while the latter will derive the great advantage of learning things which some perhaps may never learn at all, or which they may never learn when it's too late to profit from it. I tell the world what I know in plain and simple language, and will anticipate that my opinions and experience bears a stamp of age rather than of youth. In a beautiful verse of the Vedas of the Christians, it has been said of the peaceful dead that the rest and their labors and works do follow them. Absolutely, the works of men of genius do follow them and remain as a lasting treasure. Though there may be disputes and discussions about the immortality of the body or the soul, 
nobody can deny the immortality of genius, which ever remains as a brightening guiding star to the struggling humanities of succeeding ages. This work, then, which now stands the test of time, has placed King Adegoki among the immortals. And on this, and on me, no better elegy or eulogy can be written than the following lines. So long as there are men and women of ambition and aspirations, so long this and this gives life to thee. That is the end of the ruler's creed by King.